I'm glad everybody's here. And I think you're going to find this evening's talk very interesting and thought-provoking. Well, you may have heard that Governor Como was in the news recently. Did anybody hear about Como's Indian feather or, or yeah. bird feather? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, <coughs> his explanation of how he came to find his bald eagle feather floating on the water during a family vacation at uh, Saranac Lake. You all know the story, maybe? During a family vacation, and so he took it home and he kept it as a souvenir. Mm -hmm. And does anyone know what happens if you keep a bald eagle feather? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get in trouble with the federal government. Unless it's granted by the Native tribe. Unless you are a Native American. Okay, so uh, fast forward to last week when this guy that I just happened to know about because I know some people who are Native American and had used him for um, their attorney. Joe Heath was on public TV, and it, I think out of Syracuse, I'm not sure where. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, he's the uh, attorney for the Onondaga Nation near Syracuse, and he got interviewed about the feather and what Como should do about it. And uh, he cited the Bald Eagle Protection Act 16 U.S.C. 668, which states that you cannot keep any part of a bald eagle. Well, he went on to say that 99% of American land in the uh, New York State was taken illegally and in violation of the U.S. Constitution and fe federal law. And he said, we need to face this reality. He was very indignant. And I think Cindy is going to uh, tell us lots more about that. It's I just thought it was so interesting that, that this evening intersected with what was on the news. So I thought this is exactly what Cindy uh, was going to speak about, and I hope she would tie this in for a talk. And uh, so in the uh, Amazon description of her wonderful book that's highly illustrated and signed by the author, which you can take home with you tonight. If she has a pen. <laughs> if she has a pen. I think I think they're mostly all signed. Most of them. Nope, not some of them. I'll give you. I'll give you. Oh. Yeah. So uh, her uh, expertise uh, states this: a complex and troubled history defines the borders of upstate New York beyond the physical boundaries of rivers and lakes. And the United States and the state were often deceptive in their territory negotiations with the Iroquois Six Nations. Amidst the growing quest for more land <coughs> and settlers and then the fledgling Americans, the Indian nations attempted to maintain their autonomy. Yet state land continued to be encroached uh, uh, and continued to encroach the six nations. This evening, Wyoming County historian Cindy Hammerheim, am I right? You're close enough. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, takes a close look and critical view of these transactions. Evidence of dubious deals, bribes, faulty surveys, and coerced signatures may help explain why many of the nations now feel they were cheated out of their territory. Won't you join me in welcoming Cindy, the author of the book, The History of Native American Rights in Upstate New York. Some of you may know who I am. I used to be the historian for the town of Alabama between 1997 oh, and 2000. That's where you probably will yeah, me somewhere. You had another book that you read. Yes, the uh, bread and butter. The bread and butter. Uh, yes. It's <coughs> fascinating. We tried to get them and they said no. There we go. Everybody see that okay? Mm -hmm. and this probably isn't going to advance, but that figures. So anyway, um, I absolutely love maps. 
And a lot of these maps you can find online that I use. And if you look in here, this is 1718. And you can see that they have all the nations are written on the map. Here's the Iroquois, it's very distinctive over here. So there's no disputing really whose land it was. And a lot of times they would say country of. So I think they pretty much understood that these were actual nations. And even in another language it says, it'll say nation. So when I became the historian for the town of Alabama, I realized that the previous historian had never did anything on Tonawanda, and we were like neighbors. So I got to know Terry Abrams and a few people there and started walking the cemeteries and documenting. Um, and then a case came up, the Grand Island Land Claim. Does anybody remember that? Well, they disputed the fact. They said, Grand Island is ours. And New York said, no, it's not. It's ours. And there was a big case on it. And I thought, boy, after looking at I downloaded the whole answer, you know, pages and pages, and read most of it until I got, like, disgusted because I thought, I'd give them both sides an F for knowing the history. Because if you look at some of these older maps, you see Grand Island in there anywhere on that map? No. Nope. A lot of these early maps, you're not going to see Grand Island. And I think they didn't even know it was there. Because if you've ever, like, driven people to Canada or driven them along the Robert Moses Parkway, people will go, oh, look, that's Canada over there. And it's like, no. It's really Grand Island. So I thought, what if on both sides, that's what they thought? Because it takes quite a long time before you even start seeing Grand Island on the map. That, that's one reason why they couldn't have owned it. The other reason is they were still fighting over it all the way into the War of 1812 and after. That's why they had the War of 1812. They were still fighting over who owned the water rights along the St. Lawrence, who owned all those little islands in between? And they didn't even finish surveying. Well, surveying didn't even start until 1817. And it wasn't even done until the 1820s. So there's no way the Seneca could have conveyed to New York Grand Island in 1810. OK, so like I knew this in my mind. So I'm like, geez, I think I'll contact the Seneca's lawyer and tell him what I know. But. I figured they probably thought I was just some winky dig historian from some little tiny town in New York and didn't know what I was talking about and, you know, blew me off. And so I somehow, someone found out that I did that. And I had someone call me from the Seneca Nation, uh, lived on the Cataractus Res, her name was <coughs> Edna Gordon. And then I'm not sure how old she was, but when she passed, she was in her 90s. And we became very good friends. And she said, I have this small group of traditionalists. Won't you come down and talk to us? Because we don't know anything about this kind of stuff. So I would go down, and I got to know quite a lot of people. And then they hooked me up with a Native American newspaper in northern New York called the Office of the Phoenix Sundays. So I started writing a weekly column under a you know, pseudonym name, I just said History Sleuth, uh, because here I am, you know, a town of Alabama historian, appointed historian, lambasting, you know, the state of New York, because I would just say, this is what happened, you can look it up. So when the newspaper folded, I found I still had a lot of people emailing me, I had like chiefs from um, St. Regis coming down to Wyoming County, to talk to me and copy maps, and I thought, <coughs> I might as well just put this into a book and make it easier. So that's why this book exists, because I figured that would be the easiest way to do it. So anyway, now that I told you the story of my life, um, here's another map, 1747. It was in New York, a New York governor, Caldwell Colden's book. It was a history of New York. You still don't see Grand Island. Uh, but it distinctly says the country of the five nations. If you, I, I hope you can see it up in here. No Grand Island. 
<clears throat> now we're to 1768. That's pretty late in the game, if you ask me. And you still, I chose the falls, but you still don't see Grand Island. So I'm still thinking they didn't know it was there. This is the map that went to the Fort Stanwyck Treaty, where they said, honest to God, we'll never go past this line. You know, they drew this red line. You had Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York. I mean, that New York was this funny little shape thing, if you could see it, that went up like that. That was New York. And I, I am of the opinion that our school textbooks should show that because I think it's very deceptive when, don't you think, when they're teaching kids the history of New York, that they show it as the state that it is now. It, it's not right, because it was just this little tiny thing over there. And that's before they even took part of her mom off of it. So, um, but as we know, the Fort Stanwyck Treaty didn't hold, and they said, yeah, we're crossing that line, um, which is actually the Ohio River but you can see the Allegheny Mountains there. It's part of the Allegheny River, so, you know, they went over anyway. Here's another map, 1788. Um, and it clearly says, this is a New York State map done by the Surveyor General, and it distinctly says, country of the Seneca country of the Oneida, country of, not, you know, so they knew they were nations. The president of the United States, uh, let me get that far. Well, first I'll say maps are very important. Um, there's a website called davidrumsey.com. I've used his maps multiple times. And I had an email him and said, I'm doing this other book. Can I use one of your maps? Yeah, go ahead. Um, because he has a beautiful collection of maps. And what I find is, even if you're just researching your state, you should look at world exploration maps. Because you have the French, the Dutch, the Portuguese. They were all drawing maps. Um, as you can see, they're not all American maps. Some are very old. This one, and it's also on my book cover, you can see the Indian forts right there. This river right here is the Mohawk River. And you can see the forts on, right over, aren't they beautiful? They're like, you can see exactly, they drew them the way they looked. I mean, we wouldn't know that unless it was on the map, but that's, that's what they look like. Now, and these over here, they showed what animals they were hunting, different little huts. And here's, you know, our lakes are pretty, and no, no island, but you know, you don't see that really until like between when you think about it, 16 or 1768 to 1784, that isn't that much time. And in 1768, they didn't see Grand Island there, and now they do because now they're paying attention, now they want to start taking all the land. So Originally, <laughs> originally, Oliver Phelps and Nathaniel Gorham bought all of this. But what happened was when the year flipped over and they had to pay the mortgage, they only could afford to pay for this much. So it reverted back to Massachusetts, actually, because Massachusetts, New York didn't own the land to begin with. That, that's the other thing. Massachusetts owned it, because they argued over that. So there's a Hartford Compact, it's called, and I put pieces of it in the book because I think it's important to know. Um, so New York never owned the land. They only owned governing rights. Massachusetts owned the land. So then the Howell Land Company comes along, and this gets purchased, minus this strip over here that Robert Morris keeps for himself. Now, me being an abstractor, and some of the towns in my county fall into this dead zone. I call it a dead zone because it's like a nightmare to do title searching in this part. 
while Holland Land Company, their stuff is beautiful. I mean, you could still follow their lot lines today. Um, this part isn't so bad, but that piece in the middle, oh, yeah, very difficult. I still look for things that I can't find. So here's what happened. They come along, and oh, first I should say, meanwhile, while all this was going on, you had a man named Livingston buying up a giant chunk of land in the northern part of New York. And they were trying to get out, take this 99 year lease and sell the land really cheap. And the president knew nothing about it. New York was taking these things upon himself. So the president of the United States, George Washington, had to reassure Corn Planter that anything in that Livingston purchased was null and void. It didn't count. Because he knew what was going to happen. And he said, and I, I I thought I'd read this part because I really like this part. It's basically, what are they going to think of us? It is not more than four or five months since the Six Nations, or a part of them, through the medium of Colonel Pickering, were assured that afterward they would be spoken to by the government of the United States only. And the same thing was repeated in straight terms to Corn Platter at Philadelphia afterwards. Now, as appears by the extract from Mr. King, the legislature of New York are going into some negotiations with these very people. What must this evidence to them? Why? That we pursue no system and that there is no reliance in any of our declarations? To sum up the whole of it, in a few words, the interference of states and the speculations of individuals will be the bane of all our public measures. And he was right, and it, that's what happened since then. He wanted no interference from land companies, land barons, or the states trying to negotiate on the sly behind the United States back. And that's why um, the Six Nations, there are certain treaties that they say are no good, and that is why, because they were negotiated with New York, and there was not a representative from the United States government there on their behalf saying, wait a minute, I think you may need to look at this a little better. Um, that didn't happen. So that's why they say certain treaties are no good. So here's what happens. They're called preemptive rights. In modern terminology, they're called buyer's first rights or options to buy. Buyer's first rights happened, I think, with some of these windmills, things like that. Like, they took leases out on land, and they said, uh, if you're going to sell that, we want the first option to buy. So there's lots of options filed in the different counties regarding that. Or, let's say Mr. Smith has 20 acres. Mr. Jones would like to buy 10 of that. Mr. Smith doesn't want to sell. So Mr. Jones says, listen, if you ever decide you want to sell that, I would like first shot at buying it. So he says, okay, so they enter into an agreement and they file it in the clerk's office and they're called options to buy or buyer's first rights. But whatever way you spin it, it's the same as this, preemptive rights. They would enter into a treaty, an agreement with the different nations that we want this land if and when you choose to sell. Okay, so that's what treaties are, if and when you choose to sell. They are um, bargaining things, or sometimes they would contain things uh, returned for prisoners, you know, a trade-off. There are a lot of things in there, but they should not be considered deeds. And this is what happened a lot with the Mohawk land, because I went up there and searched three counties up in northern New York. I, I searched the St. Regis Reservation all the way back to the very beginning in 1797 and came forward. And what happened, New York was horrible to them. Um, there's only one legit deed and that they managed to mess up, but I'll get to that part first. So what they did was they would enter into these treaties with the Mohawk or the St. Regis on that reserve and the same kind of language 
And then, at, you know how when you sign a deed, you ever sign a deed, your signature has to be notarized by, so they can see that you're really you and you show your driver's license or whatever now, but back then, they didn't notarize the chief's signatures. They notarized the guy that said he saw them sign it. And then there's another paragraph after the end of those that say, on this day, this deed was signed. So it starts out as a treaty and it ends up as a deed. I'm like, what? <laughs> so like you could just toss all those right out the window. So here's why you should consider them nations because they are not within the state of New York. New York is really around them. The United States is around them. So let's say we have, this is their land, this whole big thing here. Here comes Mr. Land Baron, hey, I want to buy your land. Okay, so they're discussing it. So, they say, okay, I agree to sell you the land, except the inner circle, which I reserve for myself. Okay, so now this could happen. Okay, he could say, okay, I got lumber rights. He could sell this to somebody else, keep the lumber rights, uh, any mineral rights, blah, blah, blah. All kinds of things are going to happen to this piece. But what happened to this piece? Absolutely nothing. It except, was accepted and reserved about out of that deed. So this land is the same dirt they've stood on since time immemorial, that's why they say that. It's, it's like, it's still the same. Nothing about it is different. Nothing about it, the status of the land itself hasn't changed. Unlike when you go out west and the government slaughtered them, made their chiefs sign stuff, then gave it back to them in trust. Okay, now the federal government puts all kinds of rules on the land that they're actually on Okay, so that's, I always tell them, God, whatever you do, don't put your land in trust with the government because then they make the rules you don't. So that land is pristine in the middle. It hasn't changed title at all. It was the same land they've stood on for hundreds of years. It's only this part that has changed. And we still use that kind of thing, accepting and reserving clauses. Um, Mr. Smith decides now, okay, I'm going to sell Mr. Jones at 10 acres, but I can't afford to have a survey done right now. So I'm going to say, um, Mr. Smith sells to Mr. Jones uh, the 20 acres of land, accepting and reserving 10 acres, which I keep to myself. So basically, he's using the description of the 20 acres because he can't afford it. <coughs> keeps 10, which leaves 10 for the other guy. Or maybe he keeps 15 and only gives the other guy five. You see how that works? He says, I'm selling you 20, accepting and reserving the 15 I keep for myself. So he's really only selling them five. That's still done. You can look up, I don't care, flip open any book in any clerk's office, accepting and reserving clauses are standard things. So when they're in treaties, that's just a negotiation thing. If there's no deed, I consider the land not conveyed. That's you know the way I look at it. Because they knew what they were doing. They knew how to convey land. They just chose to try to get around it. Here's the other thing, tenants in common. This you'll see in a lot of the old deeds in, in you know, any clerk's office. So, Albert Green and Polly Green, that's Ennis, which is his wife, sells to Charles Smith and Sarah Smith, his wife, and Edward Jones and Carl Jones. Okay, so you got husband and wife, two other guys, that's four people, as tenants in common. They, they own this piece of property. So, let's say in September, Carl sells his one quarter to Robert Black. The owners of the property are now Charles Smith and his wife, Edward Jones, and Robert Black. That just because Carl sells his land doesn't mean anybody else sold theirs. That's the way Indian land is. 
owned as tenants in common or as an entire nation. So along comes Joseph Brandt and at a treaty held with the Mohawk Nation of Indians, 1797, residing in the province of Upper Canada, and I'll explain that part in a minute, within the dominions of the Great Britain present the Honorable Isaac Smith, Commissioner appointed by the United States. So, Joseph Brandt taught, fought on the side of the British in the war. He was Mohawk. He got a nice, tidy little piece of land in Canada. He could give two hoots what happens to the land in New York. So he's like, yeah, whatever. So Joseph Brandt and John Deserton, sometimes in the books it's destroy town, sometimes. And the bark of John O'Beal, alias corn planter. Okay, so as you see, here's a bribe. Joseph Brandt got $600. John got $600 for signing this treaty that says, we sign away our rights to any land in the state of New York. That included, you know, the Mohawk Valley, the St. Regis, because they didn't care if they had land in Canada. So it didn't matter to them what happened. And the Mark of John Abiel, who is corn planter, you know, he was like the golden ticket. His name on anything was like, okay, well, corn planter signed it, must be good. And that's the way they viewed it. That's how they lost the Mohawk Valley, basically. That's how the St. Regis Reserve gets started, because that has to do with the Macomb Purchase, that 10,000, over 10,000 acres, almost been 3 million. It was like a massive amount of land in upstate New York gets sold. And they, but it accepted and reserved the St. Regis Reservation to the people of the St. Regis. So now they're tenants in common. They own that land. It accepted and reserved. So there's nothing about that land that has changed. It is exactly the same as it had been for hundreds of years. They just sold the rest of it out from under them, these two guys. Because they got paid. Um, now we get to the surveying part. When Buffalo Creek Treaty gets sold, the surveyors there purposely surveyed around Buffalo. It's not written in the treaty anywhere to do that. That's what they did because, oh, that's a nice port for shipping. So. Same thing happened in St. Regis. St. Regis, and I had a problem with my publisher on this because I kept putting six miles square. They thought I was being like grammar wrong, it's six square miles. So every time they did it, I had to go through the book and figure out which ones I wanted to change back to six square miles and six miles. You know, I went and I finally said, okay, I drew them little pictures and I sent it to them and they're, oh, okay. So now you will also see the difference. The difference between a square mile and a mile square. If it's a man, a, a, a mile square describes shape. It has to be a mile by a mile by a mile by a mile. So when the St. Regis get their reservation, it is supposed to be six miles square, and they're supposed to have a mile square at one end because they um, had a mill, and they were supposed to get another mile square, which is now Messina, and the land in between Messina and the reservation along uh, Grass River because that's where the grasses grew that they wove their baskets with. So that was like super important. So they reserved all of that out of that Macomb purchase. So in the Macomb's, Macomb purchase actually is the deed for the Macomb purchase and it's the deed for the St. Regis reservation and its other parcels. Okay, so there's no way that that reservation is a square. But a square mile describes area. So a square mile could be a mile square or it could look like this, or it could run along a river bank, whatever way where it works out to be a square mile. It doesn't matter. It's the inner 
A square mile is the area, like the inside. It can be any shape at all. But a mile square is a mile square. So let's say that there is land that is three square miles would give you an inner area of three square miles. But land that is three miles square, three by three by three, is going to give you an inner area of nine square miles. That was the other way they cheated them. Because if I look at the St. Regis deed, it distinctly says six miles square. There is no way that that reservation in is shaped like a square. So I, I, I asked a few people up there, I said, okay, go from one end and drive and tell me how many miles. And so I have them working on that up there because now I really want to know, is it 36 miles in the rectangle or, you know, did they do something different? Because they definitely did. They definitely messed that up because it's not a square. So there is a difference. And they used that a lot. When they would survey it, they would do it the other way. So they would end up cheating them. Instead of giving them nine square miles, they would only end up with three, if, if that was what they were doing. This is a very bad map. Uh, I couldn't get it any better. It's from the um, New York State Archives. It has some great maps of surveys on the Indian land. So over here, you can't see it very well. Uh, the next map, you might see a little better. There's this funny shape over here that says land lease to M. Hogan. It was surveyed in 1845. The intent of it was to run a ferry. That was the intent. Michael Hogan wanted to run a ferry. So, in all the squirreliness, this is really, <coughs> and when I was reading it, it didn't sound like what the map was. Mainly because, in fact, I threw, knew where I threw down the home. Maybe because it was saying things like, uh, where are we here? Containing 100 acres of land and land underwater. Okay, so that doesn't look anything like the map I was looking at. Or thence down and along the banks of the river. Okay, I'm not quite getting that either. Or over the water, um, across the river, and including the river. Well, wait a minute, that looks nothing like the survey map. This here, this, so I took all those things and I put it in one of those plotting um, software because I used to have to draw a lot of maps being an abstractor as long as I've been a historian. So I'm like, okay, so what I drew was two separate parcels. It started at the west chimney of John Gray's house. John Gray was a um, uh, pretty big guy in the St. Regis Reservation. He was one of the chiefs for a time. So first they buy this parcel and then they buy this parcel. The only point of why that was done, and why Michael Hogan wanted that, was to run the ferry from here to here. That's all. You really didn't need much land for that. That is mostly water. That, that's the way the deed reads. But the way the surveyor did it, well, that's certainly not going over the water. They drew it like this. And that is now Hogansburg. So technically, Hogansburg doesn't exist. Because it's really that, you know, I don't see no uh, houses on stilts in the middle of that river. So, yeah, that was a big cheat there. And when I went up there and spoke, they were like, their jaws dropped. So I'm sure they'll end up with some kind of land claim or other on that. Actually, there already is one. But they, um, you know, they tend to go to court and they tend to think of reasons not to let them. And nobody even reads the deed, so that's part of the problem. Mary Jemison's is another interesting parcel. Am I, are you bored yet? Am I talking too long? Okay, because sometimes I talk too long. Oh, no, no, no. 
many of you know already know the story of Mary Dennison. So now when it's time for the treaty to come, she says, I really want to keep my land. Can you negotiate for me? And uh, so the way she described it when it was time, and, and she said, this is all I want. Beginning at the mouth of the steep hill, <coughs> And let's see if we can find the steep hill. Oh. oh, yeah. See where it's upside down? It says steep hill. No. <coughs> Let me see if I can. Right up here, steep hill. It's upside down, but. Yeah. So that's where the starting point is. Beginning at the mile of he Steep Hill Creek, then due east until it strikes the old path. See, old path, so right to here. Then south into a due line until a due west line will intersect with certain steep rocks. So we're down here. On the west side of the Genesee River, which we are, then extending due west, then due north, then due east till it strikes the first mentioned bound enclosing as much land on the west side as the east side of the river. Okay, so when they're in the negotiation phase of this, there's no surveyors out there drawing anything. They figure she's just talking about this little patch. You know, okay, well, that's fine. And they write it in, and when they finally survey it, it's over 17,000 acres. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> Too late. So obviously now they want to try to get it back from her, which is what they set out to do. So there's the Gardner Reservation. Um, that's just another map, 1804, when they finally got the survey done and they realized what a big chunk of land it was. And here's a composite I did between the 1904 atlas um, in Livingston, I think, and the 1902 in my county, and I put them together. So you can have a visual, like it's pretty much, you know, cast aisles all in here, so um, Mount Morris is all over there, so that's massive. They can't let her have all of that, right? So. Oh yeah, it's just oh, over by the rocks and across the water. You know, no, no, she worded no. it well. <clears throat> so now we have uh, an original The Life of Mary Jemison at the office. And the book itself is, the original book is only like a little tiny book. So now I'm thinking in perspective, okay, white people back then loved those White women captured by the Indian stories. They loved all that stuff. Yes, it sells books. But the men who set out to have her story taken down, yeah, I don't think they were thinking about selling books. I think they were thinking about justifying how they were going to take her land back from her. So in 1817, first of all, they have to make her a United States citizen because she can't convey land if she's Native American by herself. Even though, you know, she was kidnapped, she had been living with them for so long and adopted by them, now they have to do an act of Congress, blah, 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 and make her a U.S. citizen in order for her to sign off on the land. So they do that in 1817. 1819, Mary sells 300 acres to her cousin George Jimerson, which she thought might be her cousin, but wasn't really sure, but he said he was. So she did it. I did find that deed. Um, and uh, the cool part of some of her deeds, it says, of the town of Perry, because Perry was a part of Lester, and Lester was a part of, you know, how they all kind of split around back then. So that was pretty cool. Okay, so she sells her cousin those 300 acres, which, you know, out of 17,000, is that so much? 1823, they do the treaty at Moscow. Mary allegedly sells the majority of her land to speculators Micah Brook, Jellius Clute, John Craig, and Henry Gibson. 
Amazingly enough, and I say amazingly enough, her will is made out the same day. Because a really, really good friend, according to her book, which she, you know, how much of that did she really write? Because um, the grammar is just too good, I think. Um, not that it, it's the most factual and the closest we're going to get. And a lot of it jives really well. So I'm not disputing a lot of it. I'm just disputing the motives of it. So her really, really good friend brings her to this um, treaty, although in the book or in articles they say they make, she walked. I'm like, you really made that old woman walk all that way? You didn't put her on the horse? You know, what a scum. Um, <coughs> but the really good friend was also her attorney helping her with her land. So, yeah. So they do this treaty. But Mary, of course, has no idea, and this was really cool after I found this, that John Gray had already purchased the land. He already owned it. Because Robert Morris, remember that big strip I said he kept? Mm -hmm. He tried to finance the revolution. He tried to help out with this land purchase. He went bankrupt. He was hiding from de debtors. His son Thomas did most of the land transaction stuff for him because he was hiding out. Okay, so he goes bankrupt. Now they have to sell that whole strip, every piece of it. So, although, I'm trying to figure out where, oh yeah. Although she doesn't do all this technical legal stuff until September, he's already bought it in June at a coffee house in New York City at a public auction. So he always already owns it. So how's he going to get around all the stuff the presidents complain about and even New York State who had no idea this stuff was going on? Because these are just <coughs> these little side, there's too many side deals. So he already owns it. She doesn't know it. Let's do a book. Okay, so then we could like say, you know, like, oh, she went with her good lawyer and they helped her with her will and she, you know, gave him the land and mortgaged it. Never found a mortgage for the, any of these parcels that this man bought, these men bought. And supposedly it was mortgaged. I looked in Erie County, Genesee County, Livingston County, Ontario County, my county, Nothing. I couldn't find anything that said these were more that a mortgage was recorded. So they take down in November of 1823, 23, the life of Mary Jamison taken from her own words. Okay, so now you have a book that now justifies everything that you just did. So you know they already owned it legally in our eyes. They had a legitimate. <coughs> ties it in the eyes of the public, came out with the book that said, yes, yeah, she did this, okay? Even though he bought it pre her signing it away. Yeah. So that's, that's that story. Um, then the treaty at Buffalo Creek happens in 1826, where she, you know, <coughs> sells the rest, except for, and the uh, last two acres gets sold, but I, I found the other deeds to these things, but I never found a deed to the last two acres. So, I don't know what to say. That could be, you know, an oversight on my part, but I don't know. Um, so now, we're getting closer to 1838, and I know a lot of you have heard about the Trail of Tears. That just wasn't the Southern Indians that was us too. Every, yeah, every single Indian they wanted on the other side of the Mississippi. Well, our independent Indians weren't having any of that. Um, except for you have one shyster guy named, I think I would know his name by now, because he's um, such a conniver. Oh, the Leaser Williams, I forgot. <clears throat> he had a lot of dealings with the Oneida and the Mohawk. He um, also was allegedly some lost prince of France when they were beheading people and allegedly shipped him to America and allegedly hit him among the Mohawk. 
he liked that story because he could use it sometimes. He also liked the story um, because he was half Mohawk um, in the sense that his father was. And he would use that too. So it depends on what he wanted at the time, who he was going to be. Um, yeah, there's, we speak highly of him in New York for working with the Indians in, in our history. And where he ends up in Wisconsin, they're just like, no. <laughs> he was not a good guy. He had in his mind to try and create an Indian empire out west that he was going to be in control of. So, on the 1838 treaty, when I read treaties, I find the signature section much more interesting than what they're promising them in this part. That's where you find out who's getting taken off to the side, signing on a different day, inside somebody's tent. If you compare the treaty to government documents, there was a lot of that sneaky stuff going on. The leaser Mohawks wanted nothing to do with this, and they said so. He signs for them, yeah. on behalf of them, so he could get, and the only thing that the Mohawk get out of this is he gets, uh, Eliezer Williams gets some acreage to start his alleged, uh, you know, Indian community, which he does start a group up there, but, you know, they didn't really think much of him after a while. So... What happens is he takes expeditions out west. A few of the Indians went, like you, that's why you'll have um, the Oneidas of Wisconsin or you know some other, because they're really displaced from here. And the idea was purposely to put these nations that may not get along together in hopes that they would annihilate each other. But that's not what happened. So what happened in, in the northern part of central United States, where they were chopping up the land, the Indians that were already placed there said, Don't, you're not bringing these New York Indians here. You already said this was our land. So they decided to send them to this little piece in Kansas, where it said the New York Indians, those who wanted to go, uh, which weren't a lot because it was not fit for any white man. And that is right in government documents. Not fit for any white man, send them there. Yep. So that's what they did. Then the Civil War hits. By the time that's done, and the 1860s are over, and the war is over, there maybe are 32 families left with their kids. So what they do is they sell the New York land on behalf of the Indians and the ones that were there, plus the ones in New York, got something like a dollar ninety-eight in today's terms. You know, that's that by the time they divvied it up. So it was, you know, um, but they didn't expect them to live. So I guess uh, that's part of why they did that. That's part of why they sent them to desolate Kansas. In the meantime, the Tonawandas said, "We're not going. We're not going to go. Give us our money." this Kansas money that you want to relocate and we'll buy our own land back. So that's basically why the Tonawanda Reservation is there. They bought their own land with this removal money because they weren't leaving. So there is a deed in the clerk's office that they outright owned their reservation. Not that they didn't already because as I said, it was accepted reserved and already the same dirt they've always stood on, but now they had a deed in our side, legal, legally, that showed they also owned it. This is another interesting piece that I just looked at, like not too long ago, that intersection there in Caledonia and Avon, where the sign is, where they're stripping, they're stripping the topsoil off. Are they mining? I don't know what they're doing. I'm trying to find out um, through people I know, did they ever contact any of the nations because that, you know, I mean, you got to sign here. What else do you need? It's kind of obvious. It's a Seneca Indian village, a birthplace of corn planter. There could be people buried there, you know? Did, did anybody check into that? Um, so when I look at that map, 
that's I tilted it so you could, so it's pointing north. And if you look over like this way, I think this is 1904. You could you could still see the outline of the map in the 1904 atlas where it used to be. And there's the intersection where that sign is. So I mean it's smack right in that reservation. Uh, that's a, just so you can see it a little better. So there was a schoolhouse on the corner there. But that's a rather large parcel. And there you can still see it on this, this also on this 1872 map. Because they tended to leave the lines in. And okay, that one's 1902. That's pretty clear. Schoolhouse is still there. This is a current property map of that area. And as you can see, there's one of the signs going up. That's why I worry about Is that farm there? Uh, a lot of it's farm, it looks like from where they're stripping along that whole edge there. It's like if you look at it like this bump here is this bump here. Mm -hmm. And you could still see, like, that edge there is part of this edge here. Like, you could still see parts of it. Um, so, yeah, I'm trying to find out if they were contacted at all. It's like, if you come across anything, they should immediately stop, but they're probably not going to. But that whole piece where they're doing that strip mining was the reservation, so it's. And this is my friend, Henry Lloyd Jacobs. He's Seneca. Um, I probably wouldn't have finished the book if it wasn't for him. We had some really good talks, and um, he's the one who encouraged me who said you gotta write about this, because nobody else is gonna tell this story if you don't, so. I dedicated my book to him. Um, and he is standing, we went down to Pennsylvania and went to the, if you go to the Boy Scout camp in Pennsylvania in Warren County, the, there's a piece of the corn planter grant that is still above the surface. And the scout camp there is very protective. If you're not Seneca, they're not gonna let you on it. But I was with people that day, of course, we were Seneca. So we walked along the corn planter grant that was still there. And uh, so that's a picture of him on the ranch. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> that was a big nutshell. Um, any, any questions? I probably could turn the lights on now. Oops, wrong thing. I have a question. <coughs> How come it's honored? No, 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 no. I oh, yeah. Talk about it. If that's the only treaty in New York yeah. that's still honored. I, I, I go and I march with my people there. Oh, do you? Good. Yeah. That's good. I'm invited to march with them. Very good. Yeah, because that was at least, uh, um, you know, fairly legitly done as far as everybody that, you know, you had that guy from the federal government there. And, we had Quakers on our side. Right? Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. yeah. So any any questions? Now that that I, really is, it's coming up in October. Do you want to? You know, I always wanted to go because I thought I could sell my books there. Maybe people would buy them in the school. In the but it's, it's not, it's, if anybody doesn't know about it, go on uh, Candidate with Freedy. You go online, and we march from the school right on up to the courthouse. And people from the Quakers up here, and we have our elders um, from each of the nations show. And we walk right down the middle. They stop the traffic on Main Street, and they have a wampum belt that they, of wood they put across. So we were able to walk right across it. It is knowing, I mean, the significance that it's the only tree that is still honored. Right. Means a lot. So if anybody would like to go, just go online and we'll, it'll, they'll tell you more about it. So say again where you go online? Canada Was Treaty. Canada Was Treaty. Yeah, the website will pop up and it should right say up. when it is. In fact, it won't switch it on it. <laughs> yes. I thought the treaty uh, that Washington with the 99 year lease uh, that goes through Salamanca, which is on each side of the Allegheny, that's still an honored treaty. 
that's more of a negotiation because the um, they didn't expect him to. That's another case that they didn't they expect, expect him to live. To live. That's why they made it. They they came came live. Live. Yeah. So when they it came around, the now own the town of Sound Mike. Yep. Yep. They do. Yeah. The residents lease the land. Yes. They own their home, but not the land it sits on. Right. Exactly. And they about so twenty-five bucks a year. Well, it's much more than that. If, if, if your lease money isn't paid, it doubles every year. And it doesn't matter if you sell the land to someone else, they have to sell and keep the lease at the price you let it go at. So some of them are quite high right now. Some of them are 5 and $10, but some of them are way into the thousands. And they pay, sell, make the city taxes as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Gee, I would have asked for a couple of these ones. Yes. This is not the question I wanted to ask, but just from what this young lady next to me was saying. Uh, I remember reading, and I don't know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, that there was a big to do in Salamanca that the 99 year lease was up. Yes. Yeah, they renegotiated it. And the question is, what, is the, what are the Native Americans going to do? Are they going to evict everyone and so on? And I guess that was renegotiated? Was yes, it? yes it was. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's why when she's saying they have to yeah. pay that police yeah. money. Yeah. But anyway, my, my question, I guess it's, a, it's probably a, a bad observation, but usually when you acquire property to real estate, normally <laughs> you get a deed. But you've explained how there are other ways early, or, or, or earlier in, in our country, especially in New York State and so on. But usually you have an owner that has to prove ownership. Uh, and that's why you have abstract companies. Now, the Mohawks or Senecas or whatever the name of the, of the nation uh, was, uh, they had to take over that property from some earlier natives 400, 500 years ago. So they probably did it by killing them or moving them or forcing them to leave. Because that happened in Europe. Uh, well, sure. Um, and so on. But once we got here and we started and we started using our system of land title, if it's good for one, it's good for all. No, but the Native know? Americans didn't use land title systems in, I'll pick a, pick a time, 1300 or 1470. If the Senecas came into, if that's the right tribe, they right. came into northern New York, and there was the, there was the Algonquins living there, they killed them or or forced them to flee, and then they took over the land. Right, and became the ruling government. Yeah. So the government should deal, and that's yeah. what the president wanted to deal with the native right. tribes, as a government to government basis. I mean, we took over the British. We took, we, sure. we you sure. know, same thing you could say. <laughs> That's a little, if you're going to deal um, with treaties, we still have treaties. We have treaties sure. with foreign countries, I, you know, all the time. But they did a lot of backhanded things that weren't negotiated with all the parties present, that were should have been present, is well, the thing. The question you have to raise is, ethically, what is better, acquiring land through conquest or deception? <laughs> well, I'd say the legal way after we became a country, it should have been, it right. should have been, we were already a country by the time New York was doing <clears throat> what it was doing. Sure. And New York didn't even have title to the land anyway, not this part of the state. I mean, that, that. If you're ratcheting the clock that far back to the 1300s, yeah. this was a vacant, this was vacant. We don't and, know, and, and we don't know what it was. Native Americans are not really native because they're nomadic <coughs> tribes who just migrated from other places to vacant spaces. Yes, but by the time this is going on, that's like irrelevant to... Right, but that's kind of my point. Yeah, that's ir irrelevant it's to... It's totally irrelevant because, yeah. Yeah, because by now we have a government that supposedly knows how to treat people, but, you know, yeah, there's that. Um, and it, the thing is, New York knew what it was doing because that one deed for the ferry, that was so legit. 
They asked Michael, it was a lease, he, Michael, Michael um, had a legitimate lease with the St. Regis. It was all on paper, it was all recorded. New York came along and decided they wanted to own the ferry. So Michael Hogan signs over his rights to the lease to New York. The St. Regis sign over their rights to the lease to New York. That part's all good. The only thing that was wrong with, and that was legit, that's the way they all should have been done, but they weren't. The, where the trick comes in is the surveyor who didn't survey it in the water. He wanted, they wanted all the land instead. And that, that's where the sly part comes in. Paperwork was beautiful, but nobody read what it said. So, um, there's that. Yes? So who is behind the deception? Who, there, is there a grand plan, or is this happening seat by seat, um, mile by mile, et cetera, whoever is up there? And where was the president on all of this? Because the president was sending which president are we talking about? Well, first, George Watt, well, by the time you get to the, um, I want all the Indians out Jackson era, you know, that's a totally different I president who wanted to run. At the Washington beginning, sent over a whole bunch of uh, an army <coughs> and wiped out several Indian. Uh, that was George Washington. Yes. Although he did that, they did respect him. They did call him Destroy Town. They respected him as a great leader because he was a great warrior. They respected him on that term, called him, you know, great father and this and that, and letters back and forth all the time, trying to get along, um, but the states would interfere and the government didn't want it to. And a lot of these um, land claims, they always cite the Non-Intercourse Act. That happened, the, the George Washington instilled that act because the states were interfering. He was trying not to have the states interfere. And in that act, it says no dealings with the state, no private parties, um, do not to do it. So <coughs> communication, you didn't really know what was going on. Well, just think how long a letter took, you know, back then. Was it done deal before you found out? Yeah, uh, yeah, a lot of it. And that's why, like on that Livingston one in the central New York, northern central New York, um, John Livingston, that's why Way after the fact, he said he wrote to corn planter or sent the interpreter or whatever to interpret the letter and said, "Don't worry about it. It's it's not. It doesn't count. You know, it, it's not a legitimate transaction. We knew nothing about it. You know. But after a while, and George Washington's gone, and you get another president. The states start doing what they want. Then you hit these other wars, and nobody's paying attention because you got other stuff going on here." negotiating land out west and moving that way. So uh, a lot of it is really looking at the big picture of what's going on in the country at the same time that these smaller deals are going on. Like I could never live long enough to do the search or research for Oneida land because they just gave that stuff to New York and all these little tiny pieces because you know, the, the country was busy with other things that I think weren't really paying attention to what was going on there. And um, yeah, that'd be a mess to try to to try and do. Cindy, can you speak about what's going on with all these elections? I don't know. I have not read enough about it to know. All I know is I know people who are Seneca, and even they have to be show that they're Native American, they have a eagle feather. You know, and they're legit, you know, and they have to show the paper. So, I'm not sure on that. Other questions? Are there other questions? Things that you need to fill in before so you leave, but... Well, thank you for having me. They were made by an Ojibwe man in Canada. Um, his good friend of mine, she's Mohawk, that she gave them to me. Um, he, you know, would sell them for trade. So the beadwork is beautiful if you want to, if you want to come take a look at any of it. And this, my girlfriend Seneca, uh, Seneca made this for me because she said this is us. 
because this is this is this is how it's supposed to be. This is the two row row of them that we travel down the river side by side, but not necessarily messing each other's business. So, so she did that for me as a sign of friendship. And there's this is the uh, legit dream catcher, um, also made for me. So, or a medicine, I should say. If you want to look at any of this. 